lady is about to come forward to speak is very passionate about her sermon. Passionate to the point that you can't control her emotions. That's how you know you're in the right place at the right time. Somebody's about to say something to you about what God has done for them. And it's going to come from the heart. Too often, you have preachers that get up and preach to congregations that preach empty sermons. Yes, yes, yes. Because they don't believe what even they are saying. The one thing I've been appreciative for about this youth month is that the speakers that are coming forward are speakers that are speaking to us from the heart. And the church ought to be grateful for that. She will come in in a moment and she will speak to us. Is it alright if we put our hearts in the right place where to receive the word of God as she comes forward? our heads and talk to the Lord at this point in time so we know we're ready to receive what he's about to impart. Lord, we pause for a second to focus on you. Let every mode of distraction dissipate from mind and from memory. Let whatever smart devices that may be taking us away from this moment miraculously not work right now. May the person who's sitting beside us, behind us, in front of us, who's doing nothing but keeping us away from paying attention, be still and know that there is a God in this place. May someone who is here today will hear the words, reflect and know that a God is calling them to his side. May this church family be drawn closer to you because you are worthy to be praised. give you all the honor, the glory. Speak to our hearts now. In Jesus' name we pray.
I felt like I couldn't do it, but just because it's a lot of emotion. Being picked by God to stand in front of a lot of people is one of the it's one of the most rewarding things in the entire world. Yeah. So, be crying is not because I'm nervous, but because I'm just so happy to be up here. Okay, now we're gonna start my sermon. <laughs> so the title of my sermon is "Struggles Worth It." In eight days, on August 25th, a year ago today, I gave my life to God. I made a public declaration that I was going to make the greatest attempt to have people see him through me. I didn't quite understand how much of a struggle it was going to be, and still it is. It's probably been one of the hardest things to go through. And as terrifying as that sounds, I wouldn't change a thing about my experience. And when I decided to give my... I wouldn't change a thing about my experience, because when I decided to give my life to God, ever since that day, it has always been worth it. Amen. So my biblical reference is um, the book of Esther. Um, I'll be analyzing that throughout my whole sermon. But right now, I would like everyone to turn to Esther chapter 6, verses 1 and 3. What reward or recognition did we ever give to Mordecai for this? The king asked. His attempt to reply, nothing has been done for him. When I began to prepare for my sermon, I originally thought that I wasn't going to do a biblical reference because, like a lot of young people or some young people, the Bible is a lot and it's overwhelming and I didn't understand how it could apply to my life. But over the past week, I realized that there are so many things that you can kind of compare and understand that happen to people in the Bible that happen to us. So the interesting thing that I learned about the book of Esther is that it's really Mordecai's story. In my perspective, it's Mordecai's struggle living as a godly man. Going back to the beginning of Esther, from Mordecai's point of view, he does a godly thing. He shows King Zerk, King Zerk sees a gap in love, which is loving without expecting anything in return. He decides to foil a plot and save a man who has done nothing for him, to not even receive a thank you. He later runs into a problem with a man named Haman. Haman is one of the most influential advisors to the king. He's not the kind of guy you want to make enemies with. But what happens is Haman becomes annoyed with Mordecai, and he decides that he's going to take it, that he's not only going to take it out on Mordecai, but he's going to take it out on all of the Jews. Simply because he doesn't like Mordecai, he happens to be of Jewish descent. Haman decides that the best way to get revenge is to trick the king into passing a law that states, whoever wants to kill anyone of Jewish descent a year from now is allowed to. They will not be punished, and they can take all of their victims' belongings and all of the Jews will be hung. Upon learning about this new decree, Mordecai freaks out. You can imagine how terrified he is that his death is only a year away and he can do nothing to stop it. Here is a man of God who has done nothing but live a godly life and handed a death sentence. This is a biblical struggle. To share my personal story, as soon as I was baptized, I was on fire for the Lord. I wanted to see so much change happen in the church. I wanted to use all of the knowledge and information that the Lord had revealed to me to change lives, to make this church better. Originally, the struggles were fine because I was so in love with God that nothing could distract me. 
I wouldn't be discouraged and I was extra motivated to see big things happen in church. Then I got to the halfway point. As all churches have, I noticed a lot of bunny cats, a lot of stubborn church members, and a lot of issues that I didn't even comprehend why they were issues. Similar to Mordecai, I had reached my first major struggle. I reached a point where I often found myself asking God, if all I'm going to do is bring in glory, why aren't you moving mountains and breaking down walls? Why am I facing this? Why am I becoming more exhausted from coming to church than when I wasn't baptized? <laughs> Essentially, all of my questions were around the subject of why isn't God making this easy? I wanted to go back to my old ways of separating myself from the church. Naturally, it seemed like the smart thing to do. If something is keeping me from loving God and loving His people, I should distance myself from it until I'm ready to handle it. It just made sense. As a sinful human being, I began to struggle. As humans, we are always struggling. There are many conflicts that go on internally. We struggle to fight against our human nature telling us it makes so much more sense to take the easy way, to be selfish, to get ahead just so that your life doesn't suck. In addition with our nature, we struggle to see the people in the world getting ahead. Your co-workers who work on the Sabbath get the promotion before you. You miss out on so many opportunities that you see as a blessing because you're living for God. We begin to believe that how much we get back from the world depends on how much we put in. That if we aren't where we want to be, we can only blame ourselves. If only I had sacrificed more. We forget that gratification comes from God. God still wants us to work hard for the things we receive, but He doesn't want us to sacrifice the rules that we put in place, such as love one another and honor the Sabbath day. God wants us to seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and He will give you everything you need. Amen. That scripture is taken from Matthew chapter 6, verse 32. Amen. In that one verse, God tells us exactly what we need to do. He doesn't say, get some of the things you need, and then seek the kingdom of God, and then he'll give you everything else. He simply says, all you need to do is live righteously and according to his will, and he will give you everything you need, and more. In the book of Esther, the struggle becomes worth it for Mordecai in chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. Suddenly, randomly, as an act that only God can pull off, the king decides to look back in his history books and realizes that a man who has saved his life has yet to be repaid. He then has a conversation with Haman in chapter 6, verses 6 to 9. So Haman came in, and the king said, What should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? Haman thought to himself, Who would the king wish to honor more than me? So he replied, If the king wishes to honor someone, he should bring out one of the king's own royal robes, as well, a horse, as well as a horse that the king himself has ridden, one with the royal emblem on its head. Let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials, and let him see that the man whom the king wishes to honor is dressed in the king's robe and led through the city square on the king's horse. Have the officials shout as they go, this is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor. In that very second, God was allowing the very same death sentence from Haman to become a perfect opportunity for King Xerxes to comprehend how amazing Mordecai really is. And at this point in the story, King Xerxes has no idea that this man he wishes to honor is going to be killed. For no one had told the king about the plan. Esther didn't tell him yet, and Mordecai hadn't told him yet. The only thing they did was pray and fast to God to give him the strength to do exactly what needs to be done. Not to solve their problems, not to just fix everything, and not to do everything for them, but give them the strength 
so that they can do exactly what needs to be At our weakest moments, when we stop panicking and trying to figure out a way to solve our problems, we open ourselves up to God. We ask Him simply to give us the strength, not to save us, but just get us through it. Whenever God does some good things in our life, it is merely because we have accepted that living by human nature doesn't benefit your true goals or your quality of life. You are most benefited when you open yourself to God and depend on Him to do great things through you, despite your human nature and sinful self. Amen. God makes us all to be great individuals who can change the world and do miraculous things. All we have to do is say, I'm ready. Amen. The struggle is when people get excited about what they can do and forget that God does everything through them. Amen. When we give into human nature, as a church, we settle for so much less than what God has intended. Yes. We get excited about church members being more flexible, yes. and if that flexibility causes more people to come to church, which is great, but that's not all God can do. When we give into human nature as individuals, we get excited about a high-paying job and a perfect relationship. We forget that God created the perfect marriage and a more rewarding job. Yes. Yes. Amen. When we allow God to work through us, not for us, the blinders are taken off and we see the whole world for what it could be. And it excites us because that is only the beginning of the struggle being worth it. The book of Esther ends with the king making a decree that will allow the Jews to defend themselves against their attackers and gives Mordecai a power, powerful position within his kingdom. Haman ends up being killed the same way he was planning to kill Mordecai. All of the people who decided to attack the Jews without any... All of the people who decided to attack the Jews without any casualties, and a good portion of the people of the people who were planning to kill the Jews, were scared off because they understood how much respect the king had for, for Mordecai, which made him and his people appear untouchable. When God shows your enemies how powerful you become by living in faith, not only does He protect you from weapons and physical attacks. But the enemy also realizes how untouchable you are. Amen. Which is really God acting through you because God is untouchable. Amen. My struggle is worth it because if you had asked me a year ago today to stand in front of the congregation and preach, I would have told you you were crazy. I didn't think I was capable of of talking in front of people on a microphone because I hate public speaking. But here I am today, analyzing the Bible in depth, applying it to my own personal experience, and sharing with all of you. Yeah. Giving my life to God was hard. It currently is hard, and always will be hard. However, it's always worth it because I am untouchable. Amen. I'm going to close with Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And then I'm going to make an appeal, which surprised me because I spoke with Pastor Nichols this week and said I can't do an appeal. I can hardly do a sermon, so I'm just going to sit down when I'm done and you can take over. know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. So my appeal today is that if you want to be a part of the struggle for the first time or get closer to God so that he can show you how much your struggle is worth it, come to the back. Mm -hmm. <laughs>